Welcome everyone to our last session of the My Data Online 2022 conference. Um, it has been really a great day of uh, insightful and thought-provoking uh, sessions and uh, and this session that is coming up now is definitely the cherry on the, on the cake. Uh, um, I hope we've already met throughout the day, but just in case, uh, my name is Sila Sepp, uh, I'm from uh, My Data Global and uh, I'm glad to hear uh, to introduce here today our, our excellent keynote speakers, Martin Tisne and Jenny Tennyson, who will uh, have a discussion on the topic, uh, the data delusion protecting individual data isn't enough when the harm is collected. Um, without further ado, you know the drill of, of the chats and Q&As. Uh, uh, we have some time also reserved in the end for the, um, for the uh, discussion. Um, just a few words about Martin. Uh, he's the Vice President of Luminate, uh, where he is responsible for the Luminate Strategic Initiative's work to address global digital threats to policy change, campaigns, partnerships and litigation. Martin has a long list of great uh, achievements, having founded many initiatives such as uh, the Open Government Government uh, Partnership, the International Open Data Charter, and many others. Um, and as I said, Martin is joined by Jenny Tennyson, who is the founder and uh, executive director of uh, Connected by Data, uh, an, in an initiative that puts community at the heart of uh, data narratives, practices, and policies. Uh, she is also the co chair of the Data Governance Working Group at the Global Partnership on AI and the Shadow World Foundation Fellow. Uh, previously, uh, she worked as the CEO at the Open Data Institute, and the list goes on. Um, we're really glad to have both of you here today. Uh, please, uh, the stage is yours. Thank you so much, Celine. It's really wonderful to be back in the My Data community. Um, so I'm very excited to be with you here today together with Jenny. Jenny and I have worked together in different ways for about 10 years. Jenny, if that's right, kind of, I'm aging us a, a little bit. Um, and I've had many dialogues on this topic. So part of what we were excited to do is to have a version of these dialogues that we've been having um, over the years in a more open format and to get everyone's views and really what we want to talk about what we're excited to talk about is this dynamic whereby a lot of the solution sets when it comes to data protection when it comes to issues of data rights are very individualized but a lot of the problems are very collective the problems linked to democracy linked to society so jenny over to you yeah, thanks, Martin. And thanks very much for, for inviting me uh, along. And I'm really looking forward to uh, to this conversation. So I'm going to kick us off with a, a question to you. So, um, uh, you know, you, like me, have worked around data and open data and data rights and so on for quite a long time. How would you characterize like your current focus and, and why have you got to that uh, from where you were? How's things changed? Yeah. Th thanks for that good question. I mean, I might take the last bit of that question first, if that's okay, in terms of what brought me there, you know, talking about where, how you and I met um, and when you founded Open Data Institute, I think in 2012. So I started looking at the potential of open data, data sorry, around 2010, and then was really kind of shocked like a bolt uh, from the blue in the summer 2013 with the Snowden revelations. Because at the time, I'd already been working for a bunch of years around transparency, accountability, open data issues, and I've, I've never really looked at issues of privacy. I was like really, really surprised that I hadn't, and sort of ashamed. And I started thinking of the relation between openness and privacy as two sides of the same coin. And then from then, if you start looking at data governance, started thinking around 2015 about the role of algorithms in public decision-making, that was really turbo boosted, not in good ways necessarily, but by, you know, different interferences in elections in 2016. And then with Cambridge Analytica, you know, in March 2018 and that scandal. And I remember um, at the time calling you up in, in March 2018 and asking for your views on this and learned, to, learned a lot from those conversations at the time and still do. And I've been puzzling ever since about that disjuncture, right? So that's the sort of stories, puzzling between the fact that, and we'll talk about it a bit more in a, in a bit, that our legis legislative arsenal is really premised on that notion of me, the individual, should be responsible for my data, right? But a lot of the problems and a lot of what's happened over the past 10 years are inherently collective, you know, the impact on our democracies, that's a collective problem. So that's sort of my, my story. But what about, what about you, Jenny? 
you've moved from Open Data Institute. You've set up this exciting new organization connected by data. So what's the what's the story there? Yeah, I suppose it's quite similar to you. And I, I remember the the shock of the um, Facebook and Cambridge Analytica thing. I think the thing that really struck me with that was the way in which other people's decisions about the way in which data should be handled, uh, their participation in online quizzes suddenly had a big impact on, on individuals who were connected to them, right? Their family and friends. So data wasn't just about them. It was about about their connections and, uh, and about those kinds of relationships. Um, but for a long time at, at ODI, like you, you know, I, I came from an open data background. Um, we have been looking at that real uh, spectrum between stuff that could be fully open and stuff that had to be closed and, and a big gray area in the middle where you have to make decisions about who can access it, for what, what kinds of constraints need to be put in put in place around that? Um, so, in the last few years of work at the Open Data Institute, I did a lot of work around data institutions, like setting up organisations that could could manage data in those ways, um, which really also emphasised this power of like the community and then collective decisions around that data that is stewarded by those organisations. Um, and as I was leaving ODI, I think the, the thing that was really uh, in my head was how do the people who are actually affected by that data get involved in those decisions? Because it can't just be the decision making by uh, organizations that collect data or that want to use it. You have to somehow factor in the kinds of the opinions and the preferences of the people who are going to be affected. And I'd seen a lot of the literature around, um, you know, more participatory, democratic, deliberative approaches to understanding uh, people's attitudes around data, but also how those get, uh, one of the things that seemed to be missing was how those get actually into action so that organizations take account of those opinions. Um, and so, so that really became my, my, my focus and, and why I was set up Connected by Data to really look at the role of communities in making those decisions. And that applies across data governance. It's not just about data institutions like data cooperatives, data unions. It's not just about setting up these new organizations. It's also any organization that holds data should be engaging with the people who are going to be affected by it. How can we make that happen? Um, so can let's, ask you let's, a yeah. sorry to interrupt. Sorry, can I ask you a oh. sneaky question there? Sure. Can I, can I be sneaky? So I'm just curious because one of the big things I learned from you when we discussed in 2018 was that your point there that I've you know, often quoted you and others about that other people's decisions right, impact me and, and my decisions impact others. So then either to answer now for us to come back to, I'm struck though, I agree with you, we want to get people's opinion, the people involved, but what a, opinion on what? Opinion on how data about them impact others on or opinion on how data about them should be used for their own purposes. So for now or for later, I'm just, you know, that's the thing I'm super yeah. curious about. Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, there, there's a bunch of stuff that we should pick up later about, um, you know, GDPR has this phrase, reasonable expectations, right? What are people's expectations about the way in which data can be used? And often our reasonable expectations don't include using other people's data to make decisions about me that's not I expect to be judged on on me or myself not on what other people have have decided or done right so so that's part of the I, I think part of the mix of the answers but we'll come back to it I think I'm going to move us I'm going to move us on to asking you about where you see the big problems right now so in, in how the world is is using and regulating data like what's the wrong stuff that's happening why should we care why should we do something about it yeah, thank you. And I love your point on the on reasonable expectations. I mean, some of this I've mentioned already. I think that ste stepping back, like um, what I called at some point, so so the, the title in, in some ways comes from a paper I did a couple of years ago with Mariette Beshake called The Data Delusion. And, and at the time we were talking about an individualist fallacy, which, you know, uh, people could agree or disagree if the, if the term is helpful. I, I found it helpful at the time because it struck me that everyone, it's like a fallacy, everyone fell into that hole, so to speak. You know, the companies 
jump in and take advantage of the fact that, oh, well, you know, it's about your data, you know, the responsibility is on you, but I'm here to protect you, Apple or whoever else it may be. And then the governments, likewise, I think, made the mistake of really pushing the regulation solely where the burden is on the individual. I think the NGO community and the philanthropic community, we also got very wrapped up into that, the conversations around individual data ownership. And I think in the end, the public gets confused. You know, I mean, love to see if you've done surveys with Connected by Data or know of others, we'd love to get that more quantitative data. But there's definitely a sense that I used to give the example of clean water, which is you expect the government to have clean water, you know, provide you with clean water when you open the tap. You don't expect to have to check the quality of the water before you drink, you know, at, at said water. And I think that's about pretty obvious public expectations. So certainly, you know, hopefully many countries in the world, obviously not all um, on that example, but the expectation around data, I think people now have been really primed to think that it's, it's on them. And I think that's a big issue. Now, however, I think that things have changed. Um, I was actually just talking this morning with Professor Sandra Vactor, fantastic academic on those issues. Like it's very clear that an understanding that group privacy really matters and is a thing is, is uh, certainly in the academic community, that's accepted. There's great work being done by Lynette Taylor, Zeynep Tufeki, Michael Veal, many others on that. And, and I think that you don't have to fight that fight anymore from a theoretical perspective. And I also think there was a time when, if you were talking about you know, the, the sort of collective data rights or collective problems, people would be like, oh, you know, are you going to be you know, somehow losing some of the advantage that, that we've made around individual data rights? I think now there's more of an understanding that it's a both and that it's not one or the other. Um, so I think there, however, where we're stuck is that whilst we have a better understanding of the problems-ish, we're still really weak when it comes to collective solutions, you know? And I think that the, the politicians, then they really thirst. So they, there's, I think we're in a frustrating time from that perspective. I think the politicians, they, they get that it's a collective problem. They wanna do something around it but they're kind of stuck after what it is. So, I mean, an example I might give is when it comes to um, the role of machine learning, optimization algorithms in pushing ever more extremist content online, you know, via digital, on, on digital media platforms. I think politicians get, okay, this is a collective issue. This impacts all of us, but then don't have the policy tools from a data governance perspective to regulate collectively. So then what they fall back on is content. So they'd be like, okay, fine. It's a collective issue, we'll regulate content. This can be online, this can't be online. And effectively, I think kind of, you know, in the analogy of the sort of the tail wagging the dog, they then run after the content tail or the symptom and then miss effectively the actual cause of the issue, which is the underlying data, you know, in, in that business model and, and how it's used and abused. So that's just, I, I think we're in an exciting place. I think we've made progress, but I, I still I think we're kind of still in a slightly frustrating place. Um, so, so I, I've mentioned, and this is like um, very, very, very true that I've learned so much from you over the over the years. I thought about 2018 that I could have gone back, um, and that really got me thinking in a different way about the issues. Then I, I was, you know, you mentioned, and I quoted you around this notion of other people's decisions, um, you know, really impacting us in different ways. And that actually, I might put it in the link. We we then did a, a film. Um, that was done by the Financial Times a, a year ago on that to try and illustrate that. So if people are interested, it's a really cool film to look at to try and get more public understanding. So Jenny Tennyson, as of 27th of October, 2022, like what do you think the main issues are? Where have we progressed? And this is now, you know, full square what you work on. Really excited for your views. Yeah, yeah. I, so one thing just to pick up from what you you were just talking about is that I really agree that a lot of, like what we're talking about here and 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 have been for the last few years is is I now feel as being uh, commonly understood, particularly in the academic think tanky type of world. Um, you you can see in papers the the prevalence of uh, terms like democratic data governance, collective data governance, participation in AI in responsible tech and, and so forth. I think, so, So um, you, you know, we are at a stage where I think that that's accepted there, but there's a real gap between that and and where we, uh, with that being a mainstream thought. And we'll come back to like that, that's really where I'm targeting activities in, in connected by data. I think just picking up on some of the things you were talking about. So the first is 
like we still really focus this conversation around personal data and there's a there's a reason for that right our behaviors are, and and behavioral data is a is a big source of information that is used for prediction for profiling um you know from from for working out what your individual credit rating is based on what other people where other people are shopping and so forth um but uh and so it's right to do that. I think for me, one of the light bulb moments was reading Salome Villian's paper on democratic data governance, where she talked about how um, we are coming across these problems now, which in some ways always existed in data, right? We all always would have relationships with each other in data, but we're coming across them now because of that use of machine learning of AI, the fact that the data is being processed in in these in this large kind of bulk way, that means that we have a distinction between a real distinction between the people who, about whom information is known, the data subjects in our in our data sets, and the people that are going to be affected by that data, the what is uh, the, the emerging term I'm hearing is decision subjects around that. Um, th there was a paper even earlier today that, that I saw by Tana Guru about genetic data, making the point that particularly with, with genetic data, the person that you collect the sample from is traditionally thought of as the data subject, but actually there's a whole bunch of their relations who are also subjects in that, in, in that data and that might be used to then make decisions about them, whether it's arrests or, or other kinds of, or, or you know, being told information about what um, diseases they might have. So th there's this, um, so there's this real bit about personal data not really being just about one individual, not really being only personal because of the way in which we process it now. Then there are another couple of things that I think we just really need to have in the conversation that I think are very. Uh, the second one is very familiar to the to the my data audience, and perhaps I'll do that first. Then, it, which is public good uses of data, right? We are we um, uh, when we take too individualistic a, an approach to data, then we miss on good uses of data because we're so het up on the protection. And, and um, for me, then collective approaches to data governance is one of the ways in which we get that balance right between the interests of individuals and groups and the interests of society and broader uh, and our broader kind of efforts and then the final thing that i just wanted to mention is non-personal data because it's not just behavioral data that has been growing over the past uh, over the past decade and more it's also data from satellites, from sensors uh, in various ways that are then used to make decisions about us individually or as, as, uh, as collectives. So my favorite example is where um, people were, were measuring viral load for COVID-19 in sewage, which I think is the ultimate collective data, right? It's about uh, it's, uh, kind of collective in source. And then making decisions about whether particular areas should be locked down based on what was in the sewage. Or you can see, you know, air quality sensors being used to change traffic regulations in a particular city. Or you can see satellite data being used to make judgments about food prices from a particular area, for example, or insurance prices in a particular area. So we have this data, which is like by definition, non-personal, but honestly, when it gets used, to make decisions about my community, my life, it's really personal to me, right? So the, the, that's for me the biggest kind of leap that we have to make is understanding that what's the, the, the stuff that's personal is personal to me because it is affecting my life. It's, the, it's us as decision subjects rather than as data subjects, which uh, has been the traditional kind of view. Mm. No, I, I think I have, I'm going to have to quote you in the future on that. Sewage is the ultimate collective data. <laughs> I think that's a, that's a new Jenny Tennyson quote. I mean, look, this is awesome, super helpful. I think also um, we'll, we'll put some of the links, the genetic data paper by Tina Kuru, um, the paper by Sodome Vigern as well on, on data governance. Many, many people may have read those, but if not, I think that would be really cool and really helpful. I mean, it also reminds me of something that Ravi Naik, the lawyer we've done some work with, told me, which was, 
data protection as currently framed is premised on a bilateral relationship between data controllers and data subjects yeah. and that bilateral relationship and that's what's framed which when you think of it makes sense right i mean you taught me a lot about it if you look at the history of data protection going back without even going back sort of you know decades and decades but with the 1978 the french law we were referring to and then the oecd consensus in the early 80s i mean it was a time when that relationship was much more bilateral you know and uh yeah, and I and, and I love your twist in terms of the personal is how it how it affects me. Yeah. Well, a basic example we'd given we were talking when we um, helped set up the film. I was mentioning I'll put the link in as well. We're just talking about you know like the Amazon doorbells that it, whoever sells those doorbells with a video that also has an impact on your neighbors. It had an impact on you know the flow of people in the street, etc. Mm -hmm. So, bottom line here, we're twenty minutes in. We've been talking a lot about the problem. We're good at dissecting the problem and understanding that, you know, chopping it up in different ways. The thing is, is what's the solution, right? So there's a lot of people, um, I would imagine in the audience, a lot of people certainly in the, in the My Data community who've been really focused on giving power to people over their own data or over data about them, as I, I sort of often prefer to say. What, what do you think? I mean, that's something I know that you've been looking at pretty closely. Also, now you have a team, which is exciting at Connected by Data. Do you think that's a necessary thing to do, the sort of power? And partly, just to throw this in there, like control is a really attractive thing for humans. We want to control things, you know? And so I want to control my data is attractive and it's also attractive to politicians. And so what is your fence? Is that yeah, yeah. And, and I, I think, you know, you touched on it earlier that... Um, uh, it, I, I think it is understood that it's not a uh, either collective control or individual control. It's about these things working together. Um, so, I, so the way that uh, it, you know, we have to recognise that individuals have different risk profiles, um, have different risk appetites when it comes to uses of data, have different morality and ethics around what they would judge as being good uses and what they would judge as being poor uses. So um, I, I think that there always will need to be some element of individuals having their individual say over data that is about purely them and particularly in, in cases where that's really where that's easier to kind of identify right that where those links aren't quite so prevalent but I think we also have to recognize some real limitations with those with that kind of individual uh, focus um, so the first set of limitations are about um, people actually not being very good at making those decisions lacking time and capacity really not being able to understand a huge complexity that we have in the data environment and the, the implications of any permissions that they might give or any information they might share. Um, we also have to recognize that, that some organizations are deliberately or not deliberately malicious around uh, uh, not forcing or nudging people to particular kinds of decisions. Uh, so there are dark patterns around privacy controls, for example. So all of those kind of add up to this state where individuals actually uh, find it hard to make decisions that are actually in their long term interest or in their in their um, in the interests of other people who might be affected by the permissions that they give. The second problem is the lack of power that people have in those in making those decisions. There's a whole bunch of public sector services that I cannot opt out of and wouldn't want to opt out of and that necessitate sharing information. Um, there are examples like Crisis Text Line where permission is uh, where, you know, you've got some you've got young people who are phoning up wanting help in a crisis situation because they're thinking about committing suicide and they are asked is it okay for us to take this data from the the text messages that you're having um, and use it for our future learning etc cetera, etc cetera, for research purposes and in that state you are going to say yes because you just want to have access to that service right there are places where we are situationally do not have uh, the ability to to really say no to those things. And even when we say would like to say no, 
the way that terms and conditions are set up and privacy policies are set up mean that we don't have any kind of negotiation power with the organizations that are collecting data or that are using data. So we can't kind of do a back and forth about what feels comfortable for me. The only permissions that we have for making those changes are really framed by those organizations, which is a big problem. Um, and then the final thing is, you know, that we've already been touching on is that it's often not our data that is a problem. So there's a there's a great TikTok account that that takes people's uh, that that looks at people who think that they've hidden all information about their birthday and so forth. And it uh, the the person on it with permission basically doxes them, goes and looks at their friends, their family sees when their friends graduated to get a guess about what class they were in, sees when they are wished happy birthday to get an understanding about when their when their birthday is. And suddenly you've got their their date of birth. It's not it's not difficult. And and that's because of other people sharing information about about them. Right. Um, and the fact is that you don't need to actually know a whole lot of information about people in order to profile them in order to in order to make decisions about them you know you you can be surfing the web anonymously but the very fact that you are surfing it anonymously enables um, applications to make some conclusions draw some conclusions about the kind of person you are um, and, and therefore what what kind of prices to show you or, or so forth right so so all of those means that that you know sometimes it's it's not just the data that we share that is the issue. We're not very good at making decisions about that anyway. We don't really have power to, to um, have proper negotiations, um, which means that I think that that in, there are some, let's say, natural limits to the kind of power that individuals can have over data that is about them or what is known about them or the decisions that are made about them under our, under our current frameworks and the way things work. Um, so that's my that's my rant on on why we can't just take an individualistic uh, approach. I suppose like the the flip side is that we need to have much better uh, kind of government regulation regulatory action. So you know what at the kind of much larger level that governments and regulators should be exercising these powers, holding organizations to account. And I know that you're, you and your team at, at Luminate Strategic Initiatives have been doing work really focusing on that. So what do you think about that? How, to what extent can governments get us there and governments and regulators get us there? Yeah, it's a good question. And I'm itching to come back to you on your point around limitations on individual agency as well. I mean, I think, you know, that the, what I would say is one of the biggest things I've learned over the past decade is that we, um, you know, we love to talk about new laws, talk about what governments are doing. We love what's shiny and we put all our bets on making them and we get a sort of adrenaline high by passing those laws through or, or contributing it in different ways, often for very good reason, right? But then enforcement lags massively. So I think that despite my misgivings, you know, in some ways published around GDPR, I think we really have to really take advantage of what we have there and actually enforce rights object and enforce things like purpose limitation, you know, to your point on, you were saying like there's a natural limitation on the power that people can have, you know, can exercise over data about them and over that, how that data impacts other people. I think it, we have the legislation in place to limit um, the purposes upon which, you know, like to, to, to limit effectively how that data is used and how it should be used to impact other people as well via purpose limitation. I think it behooves us to really go the whole way on that. Um, so, you know, one of the things I've learned is that we need to do a lot more around that. I think there's a lot of potential in Europe for it. I think one of the things we haven't spoken so much now, and we may, if we have time, come back to it, or maybe in the questions, is um, I think we need to use the law. We need to look at, you know, we'll talk a bit more about participation, but there's an issue around just like hard accountability. And in mm -hmm. working with government, you need actual enforcement. And to get enforcement, you need to push government. And sometimes that means litigation, you know, and it means actually creating precedent. And so what I'd be excited to see is precedent at the level of the Court of Justice of the European Union. That's part of what we're working on around these landmark articles. And I think what we're seeing right now in Europe is that sadly, 
the regulators, often though willing, aren't resourced enough and don't have the mandate to go all the way on that. So I think that's something really to look at. I think we need to do a lot more work when it comes to group actions, to class actions. There's, um, I think in some ways, like relatively unknown um, leg- piece of legislation that was passed in the EU a couple of years ago, the collective redress framework that mandates a certain type of class actions across EU countries, as well as allowing for pan-European actions. And I think there's a lot of potential there when you were talking, when we were talking about group rights. So I think that's, that's one piece when it comes to the government role. You know, the other one, which sort of may seem, may, seem, may seem obvious, but I think is super important, is the governments ultimately um, in democracies are or should be beholden to um, politicians. Um, in different ways, and those should be beholden to the public. And we need to talk about these issues, you know, in ways that make a lot more sense to the public. And I think we're stuck a little bit because in our community, we need to be technocratic and like, I'm a big nerd, you know, so it's, it's fine to be technocratic in order to develop solutions. So we have to, right? And we, yeah. um, but the way that we talk about those solutions can't be itself technocratic, right? We need to go to other communities and really listen and learn from their perspectives. And I had um, a colleague at, a, at another foundation who, who I, I'd love to quote, I won't quote because I don't have a permission for, but just to say it wasn't my, my idea specifically. And she was talking about lessons from the climate field, you know, mm-hmm. and looking at what the lessons from Greta Thunberg was, that, that the change in the climate space over the past 10 years is to stop talking about climate protection. Like ultimately mm-hmm. you don't want to protect the climate. You want to protect people. And in Greta Thunberg's case, you want to protect kids and their future. And it's the same with us. If you think about it, the term data protection is actually quite weird, right? No Mm -hmm. one really wants to protect data. I mean, as much as I love data, we want to protect it. We want to protect the people, right? And we want to empower the people. So I think it's really, that's a real shift. You know, so on the government side, I think, yes, and enforcement and awareness in the campaigning piece. Um, But... Just also with, a, with an eye on time, if that's okay, Jenny, I'll just flip back to you. Um, so we were talking about the pros and cons, or you were talking about the limitations of individuals having power over data, right? And that individual agency. And we were talking about, well, just now I was talking about what governments can or can't do. My understanding as to what you're doing, both the research you're doing and the organization you set up, is it's you're advocating for something a bit different, for communities having that power. So I'm just curious as to, how you see that working and then if the time I might have a couple of thoughts on that so it's you. <laughs> yeah so so yes it's it's we're kind of framing it as the missing middle because there's been so much emphasis on on kind of individual uh, ownership and control and uh, and the the counterparts you were talking about about government and regulation and the kinds of control that can be put into place at that level but there is again this this big bunch in the middle which is much more about communities or collective action that is there to control data so uh, Barbara Prainsack had a paper out just a, a couple of days ago um, uh, and she's she's Uh, commonly calling this like data solidarity it's the idea that people together can stand up for their collective data rights their their group data rights um, uh, in ways that are more powerful than they would be if they were just individuals Um, but that also can factor in some of these broader kind of issues about the collective impact of data on our societies and democracies not just really making decisions on a on a kind of very individualistic basis but on the on the group basis on a collective basis um so we're looking at uh and and you know i think it's it's uh, a, the field is looking at the different kinds of approaches that can be taken to put that collective power forward we see things like citizen juries Uh, representatives on boards even things like user research are ways of getting in getting the opinions of and the perspective of people into the design of data systems um i've been kind of noodling on breaking down the different kind of aspects of this because there are a bunch of words that get used really uh really interchangeably so you know collective as in there's collective impact from data we, and collective decision making to, together around data. Democratic because it's the people that are in power. 
um, participatory because you want to have something that is inclusive, that brings the people who are actually going to be affected, brings their voice directly to the table in making these decisions. Deliberative because you want to have some consideration being made about the judgments that are the governance of data so who should have access to it and who shouldn't uh, when it gets shared and for what purposes for example shouldn't be just on the basis of a of a hunch or or a kind of um uh, an unthought through perspective should be something that you get to through discussion with other people and we really need those things to be powerful we really need powerful data governance that that actually makes organizations change what they do rather than ones that are just kind of participation washing um so uh so we're really interested in how organizations adopt those kinds of methods to better understand what the people who are going to be affected by their by the way in which these organizations are using data really understand what they think about it and take that into account and we're also really interested in communities kind of taking that power for themselves and how they can demand um, power in those places so that's the bit that we're we're working on it's this missing middle the community action as opposed to in either individual or kind of government action um, but I know that you and a bunch of people are kind of sceptical about, about this, in particular, the effectiveness of participation as in participatory approaches in actually getting change. Um, there's a great paper that Abeba Berhain has, has written recently on participatory AI, where she really picks it apart. And it's like, yeah, there's some promise here, but we have to be careful. Maybe maybe just talk about that a bit. What are your concerns? And, and have you seen participation actually being effective elsewhere? And, if so, what can we learn from that? Yeah, I mean, just and I, 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 conscious of time, so I'll be brief. I mean, to, to, on the record, I'm very pro participation. <laughs> you know, it's just, <laughs> branded as the, you know, the, the, the autocrat in the room. <laughs> it's not that. It's that, like in terms. I've slightly seen this movie before, right? In terms of my career, I spent the first half of my career mostly in civil society in different ways, working on transparency, participation, accountability you know, in a bunch of different places, some pretty tough places to do it, like Afghanistan, other places, you know, their own problems are very different in the UK. And I think there's a lot of learnings. The thing I'm skeptical about in a nutshell is, and I hate to be the person saying this in a way, is its ability to scale, you know, mm -hmm. is that at the scale of the problems we're talking about, especially when we're talking about platforms, big tech platforms that are talking at the scale of like tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people, like, the type of participation that I think works really well is empowered participation in the language sort of rather than consultative. So when you're actually giving the power to the communities, not only to have their view, but to be able to change the outcome as a result, giving their view, right? There's a lot of brilliant writing by this John Gaventa of people interested done some fantastic work on this for decades. Now, the thing there is that on one hand, I do think that puts a lot on the back of the communities, similar to us putting a lot on the back of individuals, that we can come over in different ways. But ultimately, I just, I haven't seen, I would love to see it work. I haven't to date seen it work in other locations than really quite localized. So the development, the deployment, sorry, of citizen juries in um, giving the perspective of patients on how data about them should be used by a hospital or chain of hospitals. So I think that's very cool, right? But in that example, unless that actually then translates to impacted health data policy at the country level, well, you know, it's nice for that people in the hospital if they actually implement it. So I think the lessons from the open government field that I you know, certainly still very much see myself as part of, if you look, say, like open budgets, and that long sort of pedigree of work on open budgets is you need transparency about the process and the input. So to write my example a little bit, like they needed to have transparency in the, and the collaboration of that hospital or chain of hospitals, which won't necessarily be the case at national level. Two, the participatory efforts are brilliant to force the conversation, to showcase where the problems are, the solutions are. But then three, you need that national rollout in that case, if it's a federal system, state level rollout. And then you need to really hold the authorities to account to do it or not, you know, so I think that here, I think it's great. I think it's it's promising, but I really, I mean, no, you're not saying it's enough, but we can't put all our eggs in that basket. And I think have to look at policy solutions really now, now on, 
you know, the, the work I was talking with Sandra Vakta, Professor Vakta, about this morning on the intersection of non-discrimination law and data protection, consumer protection, and really set those new rules, you know? So, I mean, I guess just, I, I, to, to, I'll pass it, to, we'll pass it to Celia in a second, but just, you know, passing it back to you, you know, Jenny, like you and I have these grand ideas about the way the data economy should work. I think, you know, we're still at a stage where we have a stronger grasp on, on the nature of the problem than the solutions. So if you were to pick, you know, sort of one thing, three things or so to make this a reality, what would you what would you say? Yeah, so I think we've touched on them um, really as we've been, as we've been going through. We've got uh, we've got a piece that is about language that we use and the stories that we tell about data, the public discourse and narrative about the way in which data impacts our, our lives and the kind of response that we need to it. Um, and, you know, we talked earlier about how uh, it, there's a kind of acceptance in the data governance community about group impacts, about need for collective decision making, but that's not there in the public. We need some work in the public, some some uh, some opinion formers that actually are talking about it in these terms uh, so that politicians, decision makers will also adopt it in those terms as well. We do need real work on the practice because I'm um, I, I'm with you on both the kind of uh, the limitations on these kinds of participatory approaches, but particularly when it comes to, I'm thinking about the small business who's got like three people and is doing some kind of amazing AI thing. How do they, what capacity do they have to talk to the, the people who are going to be affected by that and how do they do it? So real work on practical solutions so that aren't just this, um, aren't just this theory. And then we do need the work at, I think at the legal level, because some of the things that we've been talking about are not, well, they're definitely not encouraged and they're definitely not enforced and in some places aren't even enabled by the way that the, the law works. Um, sorry, I've taken up far too much time. So Ma Martin, do you want to say quickly what you'd like to see, in particular this community doing? Yeah, I'll be I'll be brief and then pass it pass it over to you, Sile. And I hope this has been interesting to everyone. Jenny and I having a having a chat. Certainly fascinating from my perspective. I think for this community, what I'd love to see is I understand the next the my data in person meeting will be June twenty three or July twenty three thereabouts. I would just you know love to know what the people, the groups, the individuals involved, the NGOs and others involved in this community, you know, can do in practice about this issue, you know, what they're doing now and what they could come to in the next six months or so, the next event in terms of the solution set, what does that look like? Because as, as I said, we're an exciting, but also slightly frustrating time in terms of seeing that change. Thank you, uh, Jenny and, and Martin, for this really um, inspiring uh, discussion, but uh, but also fun discussion. It was uh, great to to watch you uh, and listen to uh, to you. Um, I have uh, papers full of notes here. Uh, there would be so much to to follow up on, but uh, indeed the, the time is also pressing up. So I'll, I'll take uh, a few questions in there from the from the audience and uh, and then. Um, Hopefully, we'll have a, a place and, and time also to continue these discussions. Um, so, Bob was asking uh, quite um, in the uh, early stage of the, the discussion um, if um, is self sovereign identity and its open global standards not the best way to get the control to the data rights owner and protect privacy? Um, what are your views on that? Uh, maybe Jenny. Uh, Jenny first. So, uh, yeah, I mean, we, we talked a, a bit about what the limitations are on um, individuals having that kind of it, seeing even an individual as a data rights owner. Um, so so they, they uh, we definitely need, obviously, people need to have some rights over data that is held about them in places so that they can protect their privacy and we care about security and so forth. But we also need to really recognize the rights of the people that are affected by the use of that data, which is a separate set of people. And I, I think that's what makes me think that this isn't like the solution to our larger scale problems around the way in which data is used and the kind of um, impacts that it has more widely. We have to recognize those 
like we have to govern them and that can't be done just by individuals thank you what are your thoughts martin the same that, exactly the same you know the, the connection to the people affected the third parties affected uh, and I think uh, this uh, also fits uh, well with the framework of, of both and uh, that there is no one tool that really can uh, solve these uh, issues, but it's a combination of many. And what I'm uh, le hearing you also speak is, um, uh, is a um, reminder to think about also uh, different contexts of, of the communities themselves, uh, because the, the different combinations of the tools available can also fit yes potentially different uh, to, to different contexts and different people. Um, so, uh, so yeah, uh, and I really, really like the point about the decision subject and, and actually seeing this more as an even given agency to understand uh, how to, you know, react to, to uh, different situ life situations as, uh, as such, not so much about controlling individual pieces uh, that is manageable or is uh, potentially uh, or is possible to control with that um, i just encourage uh, now uh, all our participants uh, from the audience to also give a sign of appreciation we don't have the possibility to open mics for a uh, full uh, club but so we can see uh, the virtual clubbings in the in the screen um, it was wonderful to have you on uh, uh, on stage talking about these important issues and um, yeah Thank you also for the call to action to the community. So hopefully in uh, next summer, uh, there will be uh, chances to already look at some of the solutions in, in practice um, as well going forward. Um, uh, with that, I will uh, also welcome actually stay on stage uh, Teemu Roponen, who is the CEO of uh, events and uh, services uh, in my data. Yes, and I think Yes, so we, uh, something happened on stage, but um, uh, we're still here and who uh, will have uh, some important announcements uh, to, to all, everyone before we um, close for the, for the day and for the, for the conference. So, uh, Temu, please, the stage is yours. All right. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Sille, and thanks, uh, Martin and Jenny. Thanks. Uh, once again, for for coming to uh, to our events, and uh, it wasn't the first time uh, we saw Jenny a couple of years ago and Martin a few years back, and uh, still love uh, hearing your your excitement and passion and 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 challenge to push us uh, forward. So that was an inspiring note to uh, um, uh, to build on and close on. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody who's been here. I do have one uh, one or two announcements still. I'd uh, uh, I'd like to make. Uh, um, um, so if uh, if you allow me to, I'll just uh, take a take a chance to uh, take a moment to uh, show just a couple of things. So first of all, all um, noting that we had all in all on stage over fifty people today, uh, about thirty plus presenters. We had also uh, fifteen pitches who actually are not here. My apologies for that. Uh, and this really was a co-created collaborative effort, which is the way we, we like to do all our events, no matter how big, how small, it's always a whole bunch of co-creation. And into that co-creation goes, of course, a lot of work done by all the speakers. Like I've mentioned, the speakers are contributing uh, their time at, uh, at no, uh, no charge. Um, we are uh, helped out by numerous uh, uh, volunteers for the hosting uh, and for promoting and for, for, for many, many other bits. Uh, I'd like to particularly thank here uh, two people who have put enormous amounts of effort, uh, effort into making this happen. Uh, so first of all, uh, Julia, uh, who you have seen mainly, uh, mainly backstage, who started with us less than two months ago and was given this kind of jump into the deep end and, and, and make, uh, make this event happen, uh, who has done an amazing job in the last six, seven weeks to pull this, uh, pull this all together. Uh, and then John from, uh, from the IO Foundation, who has tirelessly, regardless of the time zones in uh, Malaysia, been helping us out um, on the tech side. So big kudos to, uh, uh, to both of you. And I think most of the audience has not actually seen 
seeing you. So uh, uh, I'm encouraging also others to thank on the on the my date the Slack uh, um, to uh, uh, to Julia and uh, and Jean and everybody else who has contributed. And speaking of uh, uh, contributions, uh, I would like to thank uh, everybody who has uh, 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 kindly paid for their ticket. We want to be accessible. So our strategy has been, our plan has been to make these events accessible uh, and not paid, um, but we test out things. Uh, and uh, uh, today we tested out that, okay, you have a voluntary 49 or 99 euro ticket and to everyone who has, uh, has paid, uh, thank you very much. And if I'm missing, uh, I checked the names uh, uh, today, so, uh, so there is a small chance I'm missing, but this is a good number. Um, I'd like to also thank, uh, thank the partners who have chipped in, Forum Virium and their Smash It project, Hestia AI, uh, H3C project, uh, and, uh, and the Uzima region, and of course the IO uh, Foundation. Without, uh, without your help and support, this would not have happened. Then how do we go forward? And I think one of the themes here has been, we've been trying to get in all the sessions uh, to get a little bit of urgency, a little bit of action going, uh, um, make sure that we are not only about ranting um, about problems or not only also pitching uh, our solutions, but working together and collectively, uh, if, if I may. Um, so here's a few things that I would uh, encourage you, you to do. First of all, you have seen the donate button in the box. Again, something that we are testing out with to the end of the year. Uh, if you like what you are seeing, believe in the work we are doing, uh, perhaps you can chip in with, uh, with a small, small amount. Uh, we'd also appreciate uh, people and organizations to be joining uh, My Data Global. Uh, and I think Vivi mentioned at the start, uh, there's 100 plus organizations and uh, about four or 500 uh, individuals from about 50 countries right now that could and should be more. Please do sign the My Data Declaration, join the Slack and subscribe to our newsletter for some things going forward. Here, here again, thanks to all those, uh, all those organizations who have committed and are supporting the work of My Data Global. Uh, and uh, uh, hopefully if your logo is not here now, it will be next time that we are showing, showing this slide. And finally, to close off as we're coming to the end of the hour and to the end of the long day, uh, it's been alluded a little bit that, hey, uh, we are in, in, in these virtual times, it would be nice to see face to face in person again. Uh, some of us were there uh, this summer uh, in June in Helsinki. But again, as I mentioned at the start, many regions were in practice not able to attend. We did not have the uh, Japanese attendance, for example, at all, and very little uh, Americas uh, present. So I'm happy to announce that we are now today uh, starting uh, the ticket sales for the super early bird for next summer. Uh, and we are meeting in Helsinki next May 31st to June 1st, uh, meaning that it will be a, just a couple of weeks uh, earlier than, uh, than last year. Uh, and we think that that's just the right time. It's gonna be nice and beautiful. And long days uh, uh, of Finland, while at the same time, it's a date that should not be colliding with other events. Uh, so we hope that um, we can see many of you in person and have these discussions also face to face uh, at the conference site, perhaps over, over a refreshment um, as well or over dinner. Uh, and as, uh, as sometimes uh, people mentioned, over a sauna or a, or a swim in the, in the sea. So I'd like to welcome you all to Helsinki next year. Um, but uh, with that, um, it's time to call it a day. It's been a long, long uh, day. We tried to get people from all over the world. 
we had about 50 countries present. That 50 seems to be a magic number. We're getting 40 to 50 countries present in our events, not quite 70 or 80. That's what we shoot for next time. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a chance to take a group photo. Um, we'll take a, take a snapshot of the of the icons. Uh, we don't have a chance to really wave and or clap, but thank you for the emojis. And uh, yeah, we'll be following up with some feedback and please uh, continue supporting our work. Once again, thank you for all the energy you brought to this uh, event. Thank you.